Once upon a time, I wish in a far off kingdom, into the woods without regret, the choice is made, the task is set. Into the woods, but not for any more, I'm on the journey. Into the woods to get, I wish I don't care how the time is now. The light is good, I have no fear, nor no one should. The woods are just trees, the trees are just wood. No need to be afraid, there's something in the glade. Sunt lacrime redem. Mono no oare. Remember those words. Kihachiro Kawamoto is a rarity among Japanese animators. His film work began in the 50s, but he didn't really discover his passion for stop-motion animation and puppetry until he was 40 and traveled to Czechoslovakia to train under the famed Jiri Trinka in the early 60s. With a checkered past like that, you wouldn't expect much out of Kawamoto. have him take over the reins of the Japan Animation Association from the godfather of manga himself, Osamu Tezuka. Animation, whether through stop motion, cutout, or puppetry, never let him go until his passing in 2010. Although not well known among most otaku, unless they're international cult film fans too, Kawamoto began his career internationally with Prague's Trinky Studio and returned to collaborate with them in 1990 on his own vision of a classic Western fairy tale, Ibarahime Matawa Nemori. In English, Fire Room. Let us tell an old story anew, and we will see how well you know it. Well then, what kind of story is Briar Rose? To quote Elo Calvino, the ultimate meaning to which all stories refer has two faces. The continuity of life, the inevitability of death. Tragedy, you die, comedy, you get hitched. Is it really that binary? If that's the litmus test for classification, then Briar Rose is clearly a comedy. It begins in the marriage of the king and queen, and then Briar Rose grows to complete the cycle, marrying a prince in turn and reigning as queen. She gets hitched, thereby fulfilling the promise of life. And Briar Rose tells the audience that, indeed, life is happily ever after. And yet, her wooden, listless refusal to look at the viewer when she says this is unsettling. Aren't you relieved to know you're not a golem? Yes, I am relieved to know that I am not a golem. Good. Do you have magical powers? Briar Rose is not a woman looking for a castle. She seeks the woods. Into the woods without regret, the choice is made, the task is set. Into the woods, but not for any more, I'm on the journey. Into the woods to get, I wish I don't care how the time is now. No need to be afraid, there's something in the glade. Look at that flesh, pink and plump, hello. Tender and fresh, not one lump. Hello, little girl. Now, in Seeking the Woods, it might seem more common to interpret Little Red Riding Hood as the archetypical mythologizing of sexual blossoming. But Briar Rose isn't the last Sleeping Beauty adaptation to incorporate sexual subtext. Although, certainly, Kawamoto had no qualms against being crystal clear. The classic Sleeping Beauty story, good fairies, bad fairies, a curse, the prick of a spindle, 
is given to the viewer as a complete fabrication to cover the truth behind an outrage at court. But the nagging thing about mythologies is that even when they may be born entirely of falsehood, they typically end up asserting some truth, even if they have to pick it up along the way. Overpowering truth. Despite the destruction of all the kingdom's spinning wheels, the story demands one be found. And while the spindle actual does not prick her finger and launch the curse, it leads her to the book. To her mother's own story carefully hidden away, the Herald's tale hid the events at court with a lie about spinning wheels. Her mother tried to hide her former love behind a real spinning wheel. And this discovery leads to a metaphorical spindle. She enters the woods a maiden and leaves awakened to passion, as once so did her mother. And that makes the continuity of life a comedy, right? Yet it's not so binary to call it a tragedy, either. After all, in the end there is a marriage. By a prince who knows nothing of her curse and just happens by. It might not be true love, but it's what the princess is willing to accept. She even admits the shattered veil her mother's frailty and her own coldness cast on the court is dispelled. Yes, her mother abandoned a lover she feared dead on the battlefield, betraying him, at least in his eyes, by marrying the king. And Briar Rose, encountering her mother's lost love, beckons him into bed. And then seeks him again, only to find him gone, and herself alone, abandoned. Agony. But is it tragedy? Tragedy is sunt lacrimae rerum, the tears of pity for human things. The survivors of Troy, survivors of epic destruction against heroes and cities, in the Aeneid say, See, Priam, I, praise waits on worth, e'en in this corner of the earth. E'en here the tear of pity springs, and hearts are touched by human things. Dismiss your fear, we sure may claim to find some safety in our fame, he said, and feeds his hungry heart with shapes of unsubstantial art. Tragedy is mono no oare, the impending doom of the old order in the tale of Heike, as the doom of all. The sound of the Gion bells echoes the impermanence of all things. The color of the sala flowers reveals the truth that the prosperous must decline. The proud do not endure, they are like a dream on a spring night. The mighty fall at last, they are as dust before the wind. Yet by speaking of tragedy with such a heavy tongue, I don't mean a situation wholly evil or devoid of hope. The Trojans speak of the tears bringing them closer to human things. The doom of the Heike is not gloom per se, but a recognition of impermanence. As an evil rises, so does it decline. To watch wooden figures is not to watch wooden acting. It is to watch a carved performance where uncanny stillness and halting movements presage blasts of action and emotion bursting in on the audience with force and clarity. Kawamoto, when asked why he sometimes sees stop motion and puppetry for cutout animation, replied it was easier. The puppets became performances the creator couldn't control. And perhaps that helps in understanding the inexplicable in Briar Rose. Why does the one-legged man rage in jealousy, then sleep with his lover's daughter? Why is Briar Rose so immediately attracted to him, so that without him her heart dies? The film isn't interested in the psychology of answers, only in the psychology of self-descriptions. The interior monologue of Briar Rose, unlike the omniscient narrators Kawamoto often uses, defies analyzing herself. If we're to look for answers, we can only observe and then orient using our own judgments. And perhaps that's the treasure offered by the film and its unique performers. The forced recognition of our own perplexity. The myths we tell ourselves become ourselves, whether we like it or not. And when confronted with those myths, we face a choice. If we choose poorly, no more feelings. Time to shut the door. 
just no more Running away Let's do it Free from the ties that bind No more despair or burdens to bear Out there in the yonder We are stories, yes but the world is a story telling itself too. But when we sugarcoat too many of our stories with a steady diet of happy endings, triumphantly erasing all prior challenges, all prior suffering, we rot from the inside. Because joy is paid for in suffering. This does not necessarily require earned happiness, but it does mean that one person's joy is another's suffering. And this mighty sword of truth if the villain's will must be thwarted for the prince to reach the princess, so be it. Some of us don't like the way you've been telling it. Go now, father! A king does not take orders from a winged elf. If instead we demand our evil fairy redeemed, then kings must fill her villainous role. Someone must pay. The journey of Briar Rose does not flinch from pain. Kawamoto exacts from his characters all the comedy and tragedy of this impermanent world. And the result? The motion picture is the most important art film ever devised by the human race. That's because it is the, the art form that creates more empathy than, ever other, than any other. It creates our ability to step out of our own shoes. One of the marks of civilization is to be able to somehow step outside your own mind and your own experience and understand what it is like to be a person of another race, another age, another gender, another nationality, to have different physical capabilities, to have different beliefs. Alone. In a time when happy endings dominate our mythology, we gobble up gallons of sugar and little medicine. Kawamoto's fairy tale is a stark reminder of the dangerous fantasies infecting our story. A vaccine. For the story of the world does not care for our happiness, nor what we take as justice. And in that absence of justice, is just us. And that is not a dismal thought. Hold him to the light now. Let him see the glow. Things will be all right now. Once upon a time, in a far-off kingdom, there lived Careful the things you say. a young maiden, Children will a sad young lad, Careful the things you do. a childless baker, and with his wife. Children will glisten, children will look to you, for which way to 